Welcome back to another lecture for Greek exegesis of Revelation. This lecture is entitled Heavenly Vision Traditions. In this lecture, I hope to provide a, an overview of the variety of traditions related to heavenly visions that we see uh, in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible and in other Jewish literature uh, from around the time of the New Testament. So in this lecture, we'll, we'll talk about the sources of these traditions or the varieties of these traditions. We'll talk about the characteristics of these heavenly vision traditions. And we will consider Revelation 4 through 5 in the context of these larger traditions. To begin, what are some of the sources for this tradition of heavenly vision? There are, I think, in the Hebrew Bible, several foundational narratives, foundational accounts of these heavenly visions. I think the, the first that comes to mind is Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10. Both of these describe the throne of God sort of being uh, propelled by these great wheels and wheels within wheels. Pictorial language, again, it's, it's hard to grasp. It would be fun to draw. But we, we see in this material, uh, I think, some important predecessors to what we see in Revelation 4 and 5. We see four living creatures and emphasis on the throne and the four faces of uh, these creatures. Uh, a second text that would be important is Isaiah 6, 1 through 13. This is the call narrative for Isaiah. But uh, alongside of that call narrative is an important vision of, a, of the heavenly throne. And so again, we, we see a picture of the one who is enthroned and the attendants, and we get this really important and uh, a phrase or, or vision that gets sort of repeated, which is the, the angelic being saying, holy, 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 right? We see that in Isaiah 6. And then in Daniel 7, verses 9 through 10, we, we see a, a pretty extensive description of the one who is seated upon the throne. We have mention of other thrones, maybe of, of divine counsel, perhaps. And uh, there's also the mention of books, the, the, the books of, uh, I think, people's lives or their deeds, perhaps. But that's, that's probably open for interpretation. And if we move from those biblical examples, we can think more broadly about accounts in apocalyptic literature. And I've provided a handout that I welcome you to spend some time with that provides an overview of some of these traditions. I provide the, the account in 1st Enoch 14 in its entirety because I think that this one is really important as a sort of connecting point from what we see in Revelation and what we saw in Ezekiel and Isaiah. It might be a, a midway point, if you will. Again, not saying that there's any direct dependence, but it helps us sort of fill in the gaps or fill in the colors of what we're seeing in Revelation. And then there are another, a number of other apocalyptic texts that contain descriptions of this heavenly vision, often with attention to the throne of God. Uh, a number of these contain references to multiple heavens, you know, a number of different heavenly realities. Uh, and of course, attention to the, the angels and other sort of otherworldly creatures who are present in heaven. And so the, the accounts that I provide in that worksheet are just a brief sort of overview or, or summation of them. But we have 2nd Enoch, the Testament of Levi, 3rd Baruch, the Apocalypse of Abraham, and the Ascension of Isaiah. All of these are pseudepigraphical texts. These are, these are parts of those texts that were not included in the, Christ, in the Christian canon, either Protestant or Catholic. Uh, but uh, scholars think were were foundational for some Jewish circles and even Christian circles in antiquity. With that overview of the sort of sources of the tradition, I want to talk about the characteristics of this tradition, sort of seen uh, across the board, sort of in a, um, in a synch uh, synthetic way. And I'm drawing here on an article by Larry Hurtado that I've provided on the course website. So the first is, the first characteristic is simply that these traditions describe the heavenly ascent of a seer. And along in that first characteristic, we would note that some 
have an account of multiple heavens, of a sort of progressive journey of going from the first heaven to the second heaven to the third heaven, sometimes all the way to the seventh or eighth or ninth heaven. Um, and this s tends to emphasize uh, both the complexity of heaven, both the complexity it's sort of other than human reality and perhaps the accessibility or the otherness of God. The second characteristic of these traditions is an interest in both the number and the kind of heavenly inhabitants. So uh, there will be descriptions of angels or cherubim or other worldly uh, figures who are present in heaven. This is a, a fascination or a point of interest, we might say, in these traditions. A third characteristic is that heaven is described, is uh, presented as utterly utter and off limits to the seer. Sometimes the seer falls down as if dead. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's as if the holiness or the otherness of heaven is, is so much that it almost instantly kills the seer or it causes the seer to collapse in a heap and, and, and sort of in mourning because of fear of loss of life. And then the, the fourth characteristic is that these traditions are, as Hurtado says, thoroughly theocentric. That is to say, it, they, they're primarily interested in, um, in God and the enthroned one. Yes, they're interested in, in talking about the attendance, but the real focus, the real focus is on the one who sits on the throne. And it's interesting that they're very, there's very little interest in uh, a messiah or a mediator figure. Um, we, we might say that sometimes the seer, like Enoch, is um, functioning as something like a mediator. But it, by and large, these traditions focus the attention on God, the one who is enthroned. With these broad brushstrokes of the traditions in mind, I, I want to return to Revelation 4 and 5 and consider some of its shared characteristics and some of its distinctive elements. So it's, it's clear once we've thought about 1 Enoch 14 or if we've, if we've done the work of, of reviewing some of these Jewish apocalyptic texts, it becomes clear that Revelation 4 and 5 shares in this tradition. It, it describes heavenly ascent. It's interested in uh, the, the heavenly personnel. It uh, uses descriptive language, often emphasizing things like fire and lightning and shaking and smoke, things that we see in many of these heavenly vision traditions. And, of course, the, the four creatures uh, also uh, represent, is, is similar in large part to what we see in Ezekiel 1. When we compare Revelation 4 and 5 to these earlier or other traditions, we do see, I think, Hurtado says, three distinctive elements. The first is that in comparison to something like 2 Baruch or uh, some of these other apocalyptic texts, John has relatively easy access to heaven. There's, there's no hoops to jump through. There aren't multiple heavens. There is an open door, rather. There is an access point that is relatively easy easy. The second distinctive is the presence of these 24 elders that surround the throne of God in chapter 4. Uh, we, we, I think, are right to think of these as, as human elders, as, uh, as Hurtado says, as representatives of the elect, as representatives of the human community. This is uh, pretty distinctive in comparison to the tradition. And perhaps the most distinctive element of Revelation 4 and 5 is what we see in chapter 5, which is the veneration of the Lamb, that uh, alongside the veneration of God who sits on the throne is the veneration of the Lamb. And this is striking in comparison to the other traditions. So what does all this matter? Why does, why, why does this matter for our reading and understanding of Revelation 4 and 5? I think the first thing is that it helps us recognize and appreciate and perhaps uh, make a little less strange some of what I would call are the tropes and the stock images of these heavenly vision. So not only do these tropes and images sort of signal that revelation is a part of or is, is in the midst of this tradition, but it helps make it less strange, right? So the description of fire or or, or the use of um, references to fine jewels or gold or, or these sorts of things um, are all sort of part and parcel for this tradition of emphasizing 
the grandeur, the otherness, the holiness um, of God's heavenly presence. And so while they can be striking and, and weird in comparison to maybe parts of the other uh, writings in the New Testament, they are sort of part of this tradition and normalized in that tradition, we might say. I think the second thing is that we would then understand Revelation 4 and 5 as part of this larger and developing tradition. Again, I'm not interested in trying to track levels of dependence, you know, which is earlier and, and does Revelation use first Enoch or does it use the ascension of Isaiah or vice versa. But I think it's important to recognize that Revelation 4 and 5, that this vision of the heavenly reality uh, is part of this larger tradition. It is a representative of this larger tradition. The other conclusions that I would want to highlight um, are, are in particularly related to Revelation 4 through 5. And that is that these heavenly vision traditions very often provide access to heavenly realities. What we would see in some apocalyptic literature is that you get access to God's presence, to the heavenly realities. And it's from there that God explains what's going on in the earth, right? God, God tells you, uh, you know, sort of predicts what's happening uh, in a sort of um, after-the-fact prophecy. It's interesting then that Revelation starts with worship. It starts with this sacred heavenly ritual, um, that that's the first thing that the seer sees. And then we're going to move from there, from this baseline of worship, into a description of, of what's going to happen when the seals are opened, or when the seven trumpets blast, or so forth. And then I think that the, the fourth thing that, that is worth pointing out, again, the distinctive elements, particularly of Revelation 4 and 5, do, I think, have as their function or one of their functions to reframe these earthly assemblies. That, that one of the effects of, the, of, of, a, of a passage like Re, uh, Revelation 4 and 5 is that it invites the, the, the first hearers and readers of Revelation and even us as contemporary readers to reconsider, to reevaluate, to reframe what it is that we do in our earthly communities, uh, that we would be captured, that we'd be captivated by this vision of Revelation 4 and 5 and the, the psalms of praise and adoration, uh, the, the, the heavenly uh, attendants who join in worship, uh, that we might, we might reframe what is happening in our own worship uh, together. Well, I wanted this to be a brief lecture on this much larger and complex tradition. I invite you to review the handout that I've provided on the course site that will, will provide some more insight or at least some access to some of these other traditions. But I hope uh, that, that this lecture helps you understand that Revelation 4 and 5 are a part of this larger and developing tradition and yet contain their own distinctive elements that when we consider the tradition, we can see some of the distinctive aspects that are in Revelation. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. Music